Uh, good afternoon. I am delighted to have Lynn Houghton, who is the Regional History Curator at the Zhang Legacy Collection Center on the campus of Western Michigan, Uni Michigan University, connecting people with the information they need, especially relating to local, regional, and state history. Her uh, public programming includes a variety of presentations, including walking tours uh, held during the summer and fall. She is the co-author with Pamela O'Connor of the book Kalamazoo Lost and Found, and she contributes to Encore Magazine and taught Michigan history uh, for WMU. She also participated in the PBS series, 10 That Shaped America, focus, focusing on the Kalamazoo Mall. Um, she has a bachelor's and master's degree in history from WMU and a master's in library and information. And Lee, uh, sorry, Lynn has gracious, graciously agreed to talk to us about our institute, in our buildings. Lynn, welcome. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure for me to be here uh, this afternoon, technically. We have now past noon, and also to see some familiar faces. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, after I've been involved with this area of what one calls public history for a number of years, my career started at the Calumsy Public Museum when it was located on the second floor of the Kalamazoo Public Library before it moved to its current location on North Rose Street. I know you probably won't believe me when I say that, but every time I do something like this, get a new presentation together, or do some new research, I learn something new. And I learned a lot getting ready for this one. Uh, and uh, so I, I thank you for that uh, opportunity to be able to do that. So without further ado, we'll get started. So since 1945, the W.E. Upjohn Institute has made its mark in research known locally, statewide, nationally, and worldwide for its work. And since 1965, it has been located prominently on West Nidge Avenue between West Lovell and West South Street. But in addition to that, not only do you have the building that we are in right now, but the Institute expanded over a number of years to include three houses that are part of the South Street Historic District that is both a local and national district. And that's what our focus is gonna be on. We're gonna spend some time looking at these three houses and the whole idea of South Street to give you some context about South Street and give you some background about it. Well, I am one that really loves maps. And so the first map I'm gonna show you is probably one of my favorites. It is one of the first bird's eye view maps that we have of Kalamazoo. This is from about 1866. It, now most of the, the other bird's eye view maps we have uh, look to the east. This one actually looks to the west. Now keep in mind, if you're not familiar with bird's eye view maps, they're not all that accurate. That they're trying to give you an impression that somebody is up in a balloon or a bird is looking over the city. And uh, so this one, it is pretty easy. It, think about, oh, they're around like Riverside Cemetery. Um, although they are, they're up in the air. So they're taking that aerial view of it. And you see those red brick buildings in the middle. Well, that of course is Michigan Avenue or Main Street. If I zoomed in on this a little bit, I would see some of the churches at Church Square. And if you look at those hills way beyond that, you might see something on top of a hill, and that is the Michigan Asylum for the Insane. So they want to give you just a general picture of this. I'm sort of putting it in here to sort of set the stage. Uh, this was done maybe about 40 years after uh, Kalamazoo began. We began in 1829. I, this map, the original of this map, is in the collections of the Kalamazoo Valley Museum. And I wanted it in here just to sort of illustrate the growth of what we experienced in the community in those 40 years. The next map is a little bit earlier. Uh, this came to us from the county clerk's office. It had been folded up uh, and in a drawer. And I don't really have this dated, but if the name says the plat of the town of Kalamazoo, then I'm saying it's probably about 1840, 1840, 1842, around in that area. And I show this because I want to say whether or not you want to call it the lack of originality when they were naming streets. Now, I'm not talking about Kalamazoo Avenue or Ransom Street. I'm talking about what they considered the border of the village at that time. How they denoted that, and I don't know if my pointer is going to work, but it's not going to work. Okay. <laughs> anyway, you've got North Street. That was our border. North Street was the border on the north side. 
on the on the west side, well, we have a street called West Street. <laughs> now that street is actually known now as Westnich. We still have North Street. West Street became Westnich in 1920 to honor Joseph Westnich and Richard Westnich, two longtime residents of Kalamazoo who both had passed away, uh, one during the Spanish American, um, the, those years of the Spanish American War. And Joseph Westnich was at the end of World War I. So that's where name came from. But up to 1920, that was West Street. There was no East Street because you had the Kalamazoo River. So that was the Eastern border of the village during these early years. And then you had South Street. And if you look, you can see South Street down in the bottom of this map. It runs from approximately Burdick and then it goes all the way down to West Street. And you can see above that, you might be able to distinguish Jail Square, Academy Square, Courthouse Square and Church Square which were given to uh, by Titus Bronson as a, a motivation to get the area be declared the county seat, which he succeeded. Now, exactly how long did these borders last? Probably not very long, because before you know it, you've got other houses that are growing up beyond those borders. To the left, you have a historical photo of the Frank Little House or the Little House that exists on South. Um, it is at 605 South Street, and this one was built in 1847. So by 1847, even though that map I dated around 1840, a number of years later, they're beginning to stretch down South Street. The house on the right is the Austin Sill home. Now that was built in 1846. Now that, okay, it was an older photo. This house does not look like this now. I can guarantee you that because one of our walking tours went by, and every time I go by it, I hold my breath. It originally <laughs> sat on it faced Lovell and Rose Street, where the Prang building is now. Um, but then it was moved about 1868 to its present location on Lovell Street. So see, it's like right over the border. Both of these are wonderful examples of Greek Revival, which was a, a style between 1840 and 1860. So you see, it's not very long that they are beginning to expand a little bit. With my love of maps, my love of maps continues. And this is one done in 1873, so you can see Within 30 years, the village is really beginning to stretch. Now, this is just partial of this map. My copier is not large enough to be able to include the entire map, but you can see, you know, a lot of the streets that we know of today are there, and a lot of the institutions we know are there. Um, so you've got the park in the middle, you've got Church Square, Courthouse Square, because Jail Square and Academy Square became a park. So you can see you've got South, you've got Academy, you've got Mountain Home Cemetery, you've got over in the left-hand corner, what was the Michigan Asylum for the Insane, later became known as the Kalamazoo State Hospital. So it looks very familiar. If I was able to keep doing this, and I actually thought of piecing it together, but that wasn't gonna work, you've got the Vine neighborhood, Edison neighborhood, all of those areas are beginning to grow even in 1873. So let's look a little bit because there's that larger map and then they have like detailed maps here. And if you uh, look at it, you can see Kalamazoo College. Now where it says Kalamazoo College on the other side of the Michigan Central Railroad, that is where Kalamazoo College is located today. Now you also see that very small square that says Kalamazoo College on South Street. That was another building that was built for them in the 1860s and that came down around 1912. So they had what they called upper college and lower college. But then if you look down South Street, which is just, just beyond, that still isn't gonna work for some reason, probably not. If you look down here where you can see South Street, you see a number of houses that are there. Some of those houses are still there. So it, they, the area is becoming very populated. People are coming here for a lot of different reasons, whether it be because of the institutions that we have here or because of the industry that we have here. Now the paper doesn't, paper is beginning to start it's beginning to pick up a little bit. So there's a lot of reasons for why people are here. And on South Street, there are some, now you look at the little house and it's sort of ironical because there was actually a family that were named Little that lived in the house, but that was a little house. <laughs> and a lot of those early houses that were built in the forties and you know early fifties, 1850s were rather small, but houses are beginning to grow. Now, why? I have absolutely no idea. This house may look familiar. This is the... Um, William D.O. House, or the D.O. House, and it was built in 1853. Um, Mr. D.O. was the postmaster, and he must have had the means 
you can see a historical picture up in the left-hand corner, which was taken nah, probably about 20 years after it was built. Um, this is on the north side of the street. And then down in the right-hand corner uh, is one that I took recently. I didn't want the car in it, but you couldn't really do anything about that. Couldn't really Photoshop it out, so it's still there anyway. But very popular, the Gothic Revival. We have a couple houses. We have another house in the Stewart neighborhood that's Gothic Revival. But um, at this time, the Edwards house next door, that is built in 1861. And so there are other houses along South Street on the north and south side. Um, we have some, we don't have too many photos of those early houses. We have some maybe rough drawings of it. So you get a general idea of what South Street was like. But it was around this time that a furniture maker by the name of Edwin Carter, um, I, I love this combination. He was a furniture maker and an undertaker. So <laughs> those two seem to go well, because if you're making furniture, probably you're also making caskets, you know. But um, he was born in Connecticut and came to Michigan when he was 15 years old in 1836. And when he came to Kalamazoo, he lived in several different houses. And in 1860, he must have been doing very well for himself because his personal estate was $15,000 and his real estate was about $10,000. And in 1860, he built the house on the left-hand side, which is a Tuscan villa. It still exists on Walnut Street in the Vine Historic District. It's between South Park and South Rose Street. So that's the house that he was at. Pretty dignified, I might say. But for some reason, six years later, he decides he wants to move to South Street. Now, is that, become, is that because South Street is now becoming more of a prominent place to live? I, I don't really know. But in 1866, he builds the Italianate on the left-hand side. Italianate is a style popular between 1860 and 1880, and it's one of the easiest ones to identify because of its cubic shape. And with this one, you see there's long, narrow windows. He's got a very simple one-story portico or porch over it with some highly decorative elements. On the corners, it's got pilasters. Uh, it's got brackets up at the top at the cornice. Might have a little bit of a hipped roof. So that's a classic Italianate. Now, in the papers, they identified that as a um, Italianate uh, and a villa. And I don't really know if I would really call that a villa. To me, the Italian villa is the William Wood, William Upjohn home across the street, the one that was built in 1879 with a really tall tower, 1878, 1878, 1879. So Mr. Carter uh, lived here for about 10 years and he moved to Lovell Street and then he moved to later West Street. So he seemed to be one that would jump from place to place to place to go. Um, now you'll notice there's a house on right next to it. You might be able to distinguish that. Now that house is still here and I wanna show you what that house looks like now. That's what that house looks like. That is the uh, Nehemiah Chase house, and that one was built in 1873. As you can see, there was a fire, very serious fire, in the 1930s that took most of the detail down, but it still has those long, narrow windows, which are so indicative of an Italian name. So that's still there. So as far as the other house that we talked about, the one on the left, the one that was built by Mr. Carter. So Mr. Carter... He and his family left, as I mentioned to you, after 10 years. They built it in 1866, and they were gone by 1876. And the next occupants to that were Dr. Edwin and Cynthia Van Dusen. And uh, Dr. Van Dusen, on the left-hand side, had graduated from medical school in, 18, um, in the 1850s. They both were from New York. Um, and they both, I did some a deep dive with the Van Dusens, and I found that both of their parents, both of their fathers specifically, had been merchants in New York and did very well for themselves. The thing with Dr. Van Dusen is he decided that he wanted to focus his career in uh, mental health. And so he was appointed the first superintendent of the Michigan Asylum for the Insane and came here in 1858. And at that time, the staff all lived on the land where the hospital was located. And remember at this time, there weren't kind of buildings that were built there, no water tower, nothing like that. But that's where the Van Dusens lived. They had two sons, or excuse me, two children. And uh, they retired, he retired in 1878. So they then decided to move down and come to Kalamazoo, come to downtown Kalamazoo. 
And uh, he was involved with his church. They went to St. Luke's Episcopal Church. He was involved with organizations like the Academy of Medicine. He was also involved with planning the hos state hospital in Traverse City in Pontiac. And they both were probably one of our, I won't say our first philanthropists, but probably one that you hear a lot about because in July of 1890, they announced at a council public school board meeting that they were gonna give a gift of $50,000 for a new public library. And last year, the Kalamazoo Public Library celebrated its 150th anniversary of being a public library. And you heard a lot about the Van Dusens because uh, the public library started in 1872. Their gift came in 1890. It's a very interesting, interesting story. Um, and they even, uh, Dr. Van Dusen decided where he wanted the library on the corner of Rose and South Street. And he also bought that land. So the total donation was 75,000. At one time, I, I'm very, I, I don't even, I'm not, an econo I'm not an economist, I'm a historian, but I have tried to you know, go on the web and figure out you know, what was $75,000 worth today as it was in the 18, I mean, it was several million dollars that they had given for this. Um, the building uh, was open, was dedicated in um, 1893. What I found very interesting about that, they wanted no dedication, no dedication booklet, no ceremony, nothing. They just wanted the doors to open. But one of the things that they wanted was they wanted to make sure that the library was open on Sundays. This is back in the 1890s. There's a very important reason why they want that because the majority of people are working six days a week. They're working Monday through Saturday. And so Sunday would be an opportunity for many of these people to get to the library if they could, um, which I thought was very interesting, very interesting with what the Van Dusens wanted to do. So they lived in this home and until 1907. And then the house was vacant uh, by 1909 when they had moved to New York. Now, so there's the house on the left. Here's the house today. Uh, the esteemed Dr. Peter Schmidt, he was in the history department at Western, and he was the one that did the first historical research on properties in Kalamazoo uh, when he came here to Western Michigan University. And when you read his history, he talks about that it was the Van Dusens that put that very classical portico on the house that's known as the Carter Van Dusen home, 527 West South Street. And it would make sense because there's the next house we're gonna talk about is the house two doors down that opened up in 1905 and had the same type of classical entryway. However, that's not right. <laughs> because the photo on the left-hand side that I've been showing you throughout this afternoon, that comes from a book called Picturesque Kalamazoo that was published in 1909. By that time, the Van Dusens were gone. So no matter what I read, and unfortunately, I put it in Lost and Found when I wrote about this book because Dr. Schmidt said it. And Dr. Schmidt, you know, he is and remains in a lot of cases the authority on this. It's when you dig deeper that you realize that that wasn't really the case, that it was probably more than likely the people that purchased the home from the Van Dusens who added that. We got a lot of clues that actually prove that too. Now it's great because you may be familiar with the fact that we now have access to the digital version of the Kalamazoo set. If you have a Kalamazoo Public Library card, you can access that. Now you may not have any interest and delving through the 1880s of the Kalamazoo Gazette, but I have a really good time. <laughs> and I really delved into the Gazette on a lot of the stuff for today, and it was really a lot of fun for me. It's always it's a little fun. I mean, I don't know. What do you say? I get, I get kicks reading the paper from the 1890s. You know, I don't know. Um, so I haven't really done too much work and find exactly when exactly that is specifically when it happened. But there are other clues that we could use. One of my favorite, favorite maps are the Sanborn Fire Insurance Maps. These were created for fire companies and insurance companies. They were produced nationwide for specific cities. We don't have them for every year. Uh, they didn't do them every year. And uh, as you can see here, we had one, well, it started in 1887, but the first one in 1887 only looks at the Central Business District. It does not go down South Street. Uh, even in 1902, they don't go down South Street. But in 1908, it does show the houses on South Street. Now you see, it's just, it's an outline of it. Now, if this was in color and the original ones are in color, they will indicate is the house brick, is the house wood. Um, it has different things like D would stand for dwelling. 
Um, a dotted line would mean that's like a porch or a porto share or you know nothing nothing permanent on that. So if you look on the one on the left of 527, you will see the outline of the house. Plus you'll see it was on a big piece of property. That property got cut down a little bit. And if you look at the top, you can see a one and you can see sort of like a, a dotted rectangle. Now that is what I think is that front porch that we saw in that 1909 photograph. But if you look at the 1932, and if you look up here, you can see it's much smaller, which indicates to me, now of course it's a pretty broad kind of guess that between 1909 and 1931, that was done. More than likely, it was probably done, my guess would be somewhere in the teens. Um, the next person who owned the house owned it until the mid 1920s. So I'm thinking somewhere around that, he added that. You'll also see that, you know, they'll have a garage indicated like that. They're really fun. If you live in Kalamazoo um, and want to see what your house looked like, and I know some people here might enjoy looking at their house as far as what it looked like as a picture in time, it is really interesting. So this indicated to me that Dr. Schmidt, unfortunately, was incorrect. It wasn't the Van Dusen's that changed the house. So let's look at that. If you really look at that, you see a lot of those features that we saw in that house originally in, those, in that 1909 photograph. You've got those long, narrow windows, very typical of an Italian egg. The hipped roof looked flat, it didn't. This had a central entryway and they add the uh, portico with the triangular pediment and the columns. So it really kicks in a little classical feature. Because around the turn of the century, the other style that was really became popular, even before the turn of the 20th century, was Colonial Revival. Colonial Revival became popular in one reason in 1876 at the um, exposition in Philadelphia. People were feeling nostalgic for what they thought was the colonial architecture. And so they brought it back. And so it really became popular maybe 10, 15 years after the exposition, but especially around the turn of the 20th century and even is popular today. I live in a Georgian colonial, which was built probably around 1932. So the popularity continued through the years. And even now you look at some of the new houses that are being built in some of the areas around Kalamazoo, they will have different versions of what they say is colonial revival. Some other things about the house, you've got that bay window on the left-hand side. That's another feature of colonial, uh, excuse me, of Italianate. Uh, the other thing that I didn't point out, in fact, I'm just going to go back a second. I don't know if we can see it here. You see on the corners, you see what are called pilasters, which are giving the house balance. Now, this is not specifically for one architectural style. You see it in Italianates, you see it in colonials. Um, so even in Italianates, Italianates for the most part are big, most Italianates are regular or more regular on that, on that factor. The other thing that you see next to that bay window, you see the port cochere, where vehicles would go and drop people off. There's one across the street at 530 West South Street. There's a port cochere, and that one actually dropped people off because William Wood, who built that house, uh, also was the president of, at that time, the Michigan National Bank. And so he had people come to, he, he I won't say he did virtual work, <laughs> but I think he did at-home work in the 1870s and 1880s, so he had people would come. And so when you look at the port cochere there, you can see that the steps are just about at the height of a carriage, which is what you might see here. On the east side there, you see sort of like a double bay window. And you see that very interesting uh, porch on the back, which you could have seen on that um, previous sandboard slide that we showed. Go back to this. So. This house, of course, is owned by the Institute. Uh, it had been uh, the site, the most recently, it had been the hospitality house for many years and, um, until it became um, available. And I was just utterly amazed. Initially, I was panicked when I saw the work going on because I didn't know what was going on, but I gotta tell you, when I knew that, the in that it was in the Institute's hands, I felt a whole lot better. Because <laughs> you saw windows come out, you saw things being covered, and. You know, I, I was just so happy when I found out um, who was funding this and what they were doing. Okay, 515 West South Street. Uh, this was acquired by the Institute in 1987. What's interesting about this house is there have only been two owners of this house. 
which is astonishing considering that this house was built in 1905. So this is Donald Butterman on the left hand <laughs> side. It's the only photograph that we know of. Um, Donald uh, grew up in Kalamazoo. His father, Dallas Butterman, was a lawyer and I think probably did very, very well in real estate. Now, I this was another thing that was said about this house and I don't have, let's go back to this house a second. I don't have any collaboration at this point, but it makes sense in some ways. The legend of this house is that it was built by Dallas for Donald as a wedding present. Hmm. His first marriage was in 1905. He married Mabel Osborne in 1905. So I don't know if that's truth or not. But Dallas, or excuse me, Donald, he graduated uh, from the University of Michigan, um, came back to Kalamazoo. And what he did is he assisted his father in his business. He also sold insurance and he managed Dallas's properties, which included the Butterman Block. Now, the Butterman Block was on the corner of the mall or South Verdict and South Street. And it encompassed just not these buildings here, but then there was a building next door that said Butterman Block on there. And, you know, you had retail uh, on the first level, you had maybe housing on the second level or offices on the second level. For those have, that have been on walking tours with me, know that this is always a stop that I have because I find it so absolutely interesting because behind that tree, there is a house that was built in 1861 or 1860, 1861, that still survives. It was built by John Bassett and the um, his daughter-in-law had built those buildings around it where you have Taco John's and other stores around there. And uh, the house, I always like to say, if you go to Taco John's and get something to eat and go up the stairs, you're in the house. You're in the Bassett house because it's set back from the property. So that's what was really interesting. Well, when it came time to that 1909 book, Picturesque Kalamazoo, I didn't know if you had to be included in it or not because it was locally produced, but you can see that Mr. Butterman wanted to be in there because the house was only four years old. And not only does he call himself an insurance agent, he calls himself a prominent insurance <laughs> agent. <laughs> and uh, it also was said that on top of everything, he bought a car. And I'm not surprised that might be the car over on the right hand side of that. Um, so many times there's mysteries and I keep thinking that I'm going to solve the mystery and I'm not. Because in 1905, there was another house that was built very, very similar to the Butterman house. The house on the right hand side is called the Connable house. It no longer survives. It sat up on the hill right next to the Henderson Castle. Hmm. Now, it didn't overlook the same direction of the Henderson Castle. It overlooked it would be to the south. It looked towards the south, but it was still on top of that hill. Very similar in style, both Georgian colonial revivals, but I have not been able to make any connection between the two. If it was the same architect, same builder, whatever. I just find it really, really interesting. I know there's some differences, but there are some major similarities. And when you look at the Butterman house, it really, really is, I wanna just go back to that first picture that I had. It is a classic Georgian colonial revival. You've got, again, that's why I said, when you see the portico that was put onto the Carter Van Dusen home, you have to think that whoever was doing that was influenced by this house when it went up in 1905, because it's got the portico. And if you look at the pediment, you see a fan light window. It's got the columns. Uh, the windows are all about the same shape, oh, a little variety there. Um, it's got the pilasters on the corner, which, yes, was an Italianate architecture, but also Georgian colonial architecture, something that they used in that to give it some balance. Um, and the port coast share was restored when the work was done on this home in the late 1980s because that had been turned into a garage. So just a classic, classic story. So the other thing about Mr. Butterman is Mr. Butterman was quite a collector collected a lot of things. Um, he married Donna, his second wife in 1919. And uh, with Donald Butterman, I, he just, he collected Native American artifacts, arms and armaments, uh, prehistoric materials, and he got an Egyptian mummy from San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, brought it back to Kalamazoo. Um, 
So, and a lot of these things were held in their house here. Um, he also was involved, as I said, with prehistoric materials also. Uh, the, um, when you look at some of the details, we talked about the architecture. Here are some more details of those pilasters on the corner. The other thing about the molding that you see at the roof line, that's called dent healed molding. Um, almost looks like blocks. I always like to tell people when I take them on historic walks, think of dent heel, think of dentures, think of teeth in some ways. That's the best thing I can say. And in colonial revival architecture and Georgian colonial revival architecture, that's what you are going to see. And here you also see the portico. Now, one of the other things that was interesting, okay, here's our Sanborn fire insurance maps again, but now we're looking at 515 West South Street. We're not looking at 527. We're on 515. So there you have it in 1908. And you can see the outline of the house. You can see a little dot, meaning there must have been a porch. Here are the uh, port, the portico in the front, two-story. This is two-story. But if you look at 1932, there's something that has been added to the rear. Now, when that was, I don't know. I've not taken a deep dive into the Gazette to find out exactly what that was. And it's that back end of the house. So what was that for? Well, all their collections. Because on top of what, what Donald collected, Donna collected dolls. That was what she liked, all kinds of dolls. And I've been told that that was their museum in those sections. Now, was it on both floors? I don't know. I don't have enough information about it. The museum might have information because the museum, the Kalamazoo Valley Museum, was one of the benefactors of Donald Bunneman's collection. When you look at those early years in the 1920s, which were the early years of the museum, there were two major collectors, A.M. Todd and Donald Bunneman, that gave a lot of material to them for that. So Donald passed away in 1949, and Donna continued living in that house until 1987, wow. until she passed away. So um, there were a couple articles. The one on the left, she is with Alexis Prowse, who was a longtime director of the Kalamazoo Public Museum, now the Kalamazoo Valley Museum. And it talks about a gift that she was giving the museum um, for some reason, and I don't know why. You never know where some of these things come from. Um, she had a couple, she had a lot of friends, but she had this couple who their son gave a lot of stuff to us. And in the midst of that, the material that they gave us, and what I get is mostly paper, uh, paper based material. I don't get artifacts, were her diaries after Donald died which are absolutely fascinating to read because she spent so much time trying to sell the things he had. So he had already given material to the <laughs> museum, to other places, and there was more for her to sell. So she writes in her diary about um, having people from Cranbrook, the Institute of Science, having people from um, the Michigan State University come by. I'm sure University of Michigan came by too because he had already given material to the University of Michigan. Now, as I mentioned to you, her big thing was dolls. And here she owned 400 antique dolls. Maybe that filled, filled the whole first <laughs> floor of that wing. I'm not really too sure. And she talks about selling them in 1951. She sold, I think she said 53 cartons of dolls. I don't know exactly how much it cost, how much she made from it, but just absolutely fascinating on that. The mummy itself, um, going back to the mummy, so he purchased it in 1910 in San Francisco at the Golden Gate Museum. Um, it had been owned by a private collector. He brought it to Kalamazoo and it lived in his house for 18 years. It was there until 1928 when it was moved to the Kalamazoo Public Museum. And the museum at that time was located in a house next to the library. So it was located on South Rose Street. And the mummy is still there if you go to the museum, the mummy from Donald Bunneman. A lot of the other Egyptian related materials came from A.M. Todd, so that's what they had. So as I mentioned to you, Donna passed away in 1987. And I don't know if this gentleman in the picture yeah, looks very off straight. <laughs> I knew there would be someone here who still knew Robert Straits. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Staff member here at the Institute and also a city commissioner. Uh, for the city of Kalamazoo for several years. And he's standing in front of the house where it is, re it is announced in 1987 that the Institute is purchasing it. Now, the photograph is not the greatest, I will admit it. One of the things that we have to say is we have the archives of the Kalamazoo Gazette. And within that are not as many photographs as I would like to see, but that's a whole nother matter. 
And uh, this one I think was not very, was not washed very good because it does have a very sort of tan tint. You can see fingerprints, whatever. But if you looked closely, you could see that that house was really in, I mean, she had been living there for over 70 years. And so you had a garage on the right-hand side, whether or not that was a garage or a shed or whatever, I'm not, no, I think it was a garage. Um, the house was in disrepair. So they announced in 1987 that they had purchased the house. And for, Nat, for uh, historic preservation week in May of 1990, there was an open house. So the public got to come in and tour the house um, and see what it looked like inside. And so that was really, really very, very nice. Okay, so now across the street, from there is this house. Now this was an interesting one for me because I had never delved into the history of this house at 501, 504 West South Street. It's the Horace and Lizzie Fuller house. And uh, for this one, let's go to the Sanborn maps. And this one was, was, this is what was confusing me a little bit since I really had to do, again, another deep dive in the Gazette. So the 1908, now we're looking across the street from the Butterman house. And so in 1908, we have the Gilmore house is right here. And then the William Wood, William Upjohn home on the next to it. And this house right here. And I could not figure out what that house was for a long time. Never had a picture of that. And that turned out to be a house that was built in 1856, uh, the May house. And um, so the Fullers <coughs> had lived there for a short time. Um, they moved there in 1907. So there were a series of people that lived in that house, but it had either a 502 or a 504 address. So it was a little bit confusing when you looked at it. Um, Horace worked for his father, George Fuller, who had the Kalamazoo Hack and Bus Company, which was located around Farmer's Alley, just around the corner from the Kalamazoo Mall. Lizzie was actually a granddaughter of Benjamin Drake. And Horace must have done very well because he had a farm with horses, he was a stockholder in Recreation Park, which is where the county fairgrounds were. And so now we see a 1932 Sanborn fire insurance map. So you've got the Wood Up John, you've got the Gilmore House, and then you've got the Fuller House, which is the picture that I showed you. And uh, so this is it today. And uh, there it was in the paper at, after you searched and searched and searched, which I did. Um, in 1912, the Gazette announced that they were going to build a house on this site. Uh, Mr. Fuller went to Grand Rapids for the architect, which was George Stone. And uh, the builder was also from Grand Rapids, George Hoaxma. And this one was completed in 1914. The style that they say it was, I love this. I have never heard this terminology before. Revised colonial. <laughs> I've heard colonial. I've heard colonial revival. I've heard Georgian colonial revival. I have never heard of revised colonial. So that was interesting. Now, Horace, some of the things he was interested in was very, very interesting. And one of the things he did uh, was open up the Fuller Theater in 1909. So maybe that's the reason why they lived on South Street because it wasn't far from the theater. The, Ho the Fuller Theater was right here. This building might look very familiar. It was Montgomery Wards. It's now, it was Walgreens for a long time. And now there are two stores that are in, in it right now. So the Fuller Theater was just one of the many, many theaters that you found in downtown Kalamazoo. And uh, it was sort of funny because they had a campaign to name the theater. So they had all these people that put in their, you know, I don't know what the prize was or anything else like that. And it came out that the winning, the winning one they chose was Fuller Theater. I thought, come on. That, <laughs> was it rigged in some way? Did Mr. Fuller, was he, did he like stuff the ballots or something? You know, I don't really know. But so many of those theaters at that time were clever in the sense that, yes, you had the theater, but then you had office space in front of it. So you would have more income coming in other than when people are going to go see a movie. And a lot of these movie theaters at this time were combined vaudeville and movie theaters. So you'd always have a show, there'd be a movie, you know, different acts. And so that was the Fuller Theater. Now the Fuller Theater stayed open until 1953. Uh, I think Mr. Fuller was long disassociated with it. Now on the Kalamazoo Mall, the Fuller Theater building, that front part of the Fuller Theater building is still there. It's this building right here where Pedals and Postings is located. And if you look up above, there's a stone up there that says Fuller with the date of 1909. So that is still there. Well, let's go back to his house. Okay. Revised Colonial. 
So what does that really mean? I don't know. I've checked all my architecture books and I didn't see that. But one of the things with colonial is a symmetrical house. It's not going to be like a Queen Anne, which was popular between 1880 and 1900, where there are all kinds of angles and, you know, just different, different types of windows and different colors and different siding. So this is a very regular house. You've got dormers coming off the roof line. It said it was made of stucco, but it looks like it is brick at this point. It does have a bay window on the side. One of the things that I found interesting, I also found interesting on Sunday morning after you get done walking the Bronson Children's Health Run and Walk, that there's not too many people around South Street. So you can go on South Street and go around and take pictures. Not that I did anything, but like walking on the side of the building. And one of the things you see in this house, you see this molding up above at the top, that's called egg and dart molding which you'll sometimes see both interiors and exteriors. And the way they explain it, very understandable, you've got the egg in the middle and you've got the two darts. You literally, if you look at it, you've got darts pointing down on this one. So you see that throughout the exterior, you also see the windows um, on that. Um, that decorative porch with those shields, I think that's really colonial. And you see they continue that egg and dart. It's very massive. Um, and when you look at that entry, it was very hard for me to sort of get a good picture. I don't have a very good camera either, but it's done very well. Um, when you look at that front part of it, um, you see a central doorway with side lights. I mean, it was a massive house when you look at that, more than likely because of the brick. So built in 1914. So Lizzie Kidder Fuller died in 1943. Um, and in 1950, there was a man named Ray Farnham, Farnham who was a furrier and he wanted to locate his business there that he was denied by the city of Kalamazoo. And then in 1952, you have the law offices of Gemrick, Moser, Bowser and Graham. Now that name changed through the years that purchased the home. So the law firm was there from 1952 until they merged with Howard and Howard in 2001. Now I'm not sure exactly when it was that the Institute purchased this house 2002. 2002? Okay. Now, I I have been a member of both the Kalamazoo Historic Preservation Commission and the Kalamazoo Historic District Commission, um, which are city advisory boards. And somehow I remember, and I don't know if this was accurate, you're not going to find this in the newspaper. I remember one time, I think there was a fraternity that was looking at turning that into a fraternity house. But that was very slight. Now, I'm not saying that that was the motivation for the Institute to purchase this house. <laughs> <laughs> But the prospect of having a fraternity house across the street, <laughs> I don't know. And I don't think that was the only reason why, but they acquired it in 2002. So that's what they have. So when you look at the WEF John Institute, so many of you know the history of this organization. Yes, WEF John in 1932 had started um, is study uh, after seeing what was going on during the Great Depression. And so then in 1945, you had the creation of the WEF John Institute for Community Research. During those early years, the offices were in the American National Bank building, the big tall building that you see there uh, that was completed in 1930, uh, was designed by the architectural firm of Weary and Alford. So the, uh, so the offices were there um, at the beginning in 1945. Within five years, they moved to this building on South Westnich. Uh, it was the central apartments. It's located on the corner of Dutton and South Westnich. It's sort of like across the street almost from old Central High School. So they moved there in 1950 and were there. And then in 1964, they, the Institute had purchased some property on South Westnich between South and Lovell Street. Going back to our 1932 Sanborn, you can see the three properties that they had purchased for their headquarters. Um, going back to that photograph of the uh, building that used to be in, once the Institute left that building, then the community chest, which later became the United Way, moved in there. And then eventually they took that building down for the building that was built behind that is still there. So as far as the property that the Institute um, had, there's one building that I wanted to point out that came down as a result of them wanting to build their headquarters on this piece of property. And that's the shaded, 
building that you see up in that area. That was the Burnham House. Um, the Burnham House, now, please keep in mind, in 1964, this house did not look like this. <laughs> um, this house was built in 1883. It was built for Mary and Giles Burnham. It was described as being built, uh, well, it was a Queen Anne built with green stone. I really wish these pictures were in color because I would have loved to have seen it. It was amazing to me that no matter what articles you, you read, they couldn't quite agree where the green stone came from. It either came from Vermont, either came from England, or it came from the Upper Peninsula. I, I don't know. Every article I read said that the green stone came somewhere else. It had 24 rooms. It had woodwork of butternut, mahogany, and oak, 16 chandeliers, uh, stained glass, and so the Burnham stayed there until 1925 when it became known as the gown shop up in the left-hand corner. And it was the place <laughs> where women would go to buy dresses, whether they be everyday dresses or dresses for special occasions. Um, and uh, it was a very lavish place for people because the girls would be able to walk down the stairway. and uh, They would be able to do that. So that stayed in business until about 1959. And then it became Sharp's Colonial House Furniture. Although when you see this picture, they are getting, they're taking it down to make way for the Institute's new headquarters. Now I have been, now this was before, of course, before there was a national, before there was a local historic district, before there was a national historic district. In fact, I have had people say to me that was because of what happened to the Burnham's, the Burnham House, it sort of pushed things along. I don't know, I was not here at that time, but, um, I, I got confirmation on this this morning. If you go to the Gilmore Car Museum in one of the red barns, there is an old stairway and an old railing. And I'm pretty sure it came from the Burnham House. And it makes sense that it would end up at the Gilmore Car Museum because Donald Gilmore was, of course, very much involved with the Institute. And if I'm not mistaken, what may have been on the board. So it made sense that some of the stuff may have been salvaged and taken over to the car museum at that time. And when you look at the portion of the building along South Westage, that is the part that was completed in 1965. And then you have the new addition that was done, what did I say, 2005? One in front? I think it was we, two, we moved back in 2003. 2003, okay. So you have that there. Thank you very much for that. So I really do want to thank the Institute, the W. E. Upshaw Institute, for not only the work that you do in um, research uh, in the fields that you are working in, but I also really do want to thank you for your investment in the community, especially with these properties on South Street. Um, those of us that are involved with this field just feel really grateful that these buildings are in good hands and that they have been well taken care of and that you are such wonderful caretakers of these buildings. So thank you very much. Now, my little blurb for me, uh, where I am, <laughs> this is your commercial. Um, this is the Zang Legacy Collection Center. Uh, there's actually three departments that are in that. We are part of the university library system. Um, as Michael said, I am the curator of the regional history collections. We collect material from a 12 county area of Southwestern Michigan. Um, we also have the university archives that has historical material that deal with the history and current operations of the university. And we also have rare books and special collections. Uh, it is a department of the library that has things like medieval manuscripts, medieval facsimiles. Uh, they also have uh, women's poetry collections. They also have a, a wide range of collections. We deal, pro we deal with students that come and visit us, uh, not only from Western. And in fact, this has been our very busy time this month as students have come and visit us from a number of departments, history, English, art, you name it, they come to see our materials to use for various projects. Um, in addition, I've worked now, I'm working with more K, uh, Kalamazoo College students and what I've done before. We also work with students between the grades, grades four through 12 who participate in an event called History Day because they need certain resources for their entries to enter that competition. And we will have the regional competition here in March. We also deal with anybody from the community. Sometimes people think, that they had to have, they have to have some association with the university to come into the building. I get emails from people. Can you answer this question? I also have a BA and an MA from Western. And I keep trying to, you, know, you do not have to have a degree from Western to use our facility. Uh, we have been in this building for 10 years now. I'm so ever grateful that we are in this building. It was, the money was all raised privately. 
Uh, the Charles and Lin Zhang uh, very generously gave about $2 million towards that, but everything else was raised by individual donors. Um, it is a purpose-driven building. We have temperature and humidity control, and we have uh, so many features that we never had in the other locations we were uh, before pre-October of 2013. Uh, we are open Tuesday through Saturday. If you're ever driving by, we are on the historic grounds of the State Hospital. We are at 1650 Oakland Drive. Before you hit Howard Street, you'll see this very huge sign that will say Zhang Legacy Collection Center, and that's where we are located. My records sort of fall into, um, I have business records, like I have the Upjohn Company records uh, that people come and research. I have um, individual records, diaries, letters that people will use. Um, I also have records that are deposited to us, for example, the Ladies Library Association, the first organization in the state of Michigan. And people will come and use us for research. Um, I have a bibliography that I like to use that shows that we've had over 100 books that have been written from people using our resources. So that's really admirable. And that's really good to see that kind of thing because people always want to say, well, how many credit hours are you doing? We're not doing that, but look at the products that we are. So if you come by and you just want to stop by and see, I can promise you, as Laura can attest, a very unusual space, please do. Thank you very much for this, and I hope you have a good rest of the day. So much. Uh, we do have time for questions, and I think we have one on the Zoom. Right. Uh, I, I wanted to know if you had any thoughts about the house that was on the property that was moved down level and then has been subsequently yeah. destroyed. Which one down level? The, it was. Right. Oh, we had a uh, house we at the end of the parking lot on, on yeah. level. And it became the, lo the lawyer moved it. Yeah, the lawyer and, moved it. And, then... and they moved it to. We, we used to have a house at the end of the parking lot yeah. that was at some point someone bought it. It was a law firm, and they moved it over um, Portage, Portage, Portage and Love Street. Yeah. Portage and Love. I think it's still is it still there? No, it's been. It's been lost. Yeah, I need to. I need to check this. The ones I'm familiar with is the one that Lou Conti moved down Lovell Street, and then there was the other one that they moved over into the Vine neighborhood on Walnut. Those are the two that I'm familiar with. I'm not sure about that. If a building is not in a local historic district, you know, there's there the protect the protections are much stronger if it's a local historic district. Uh, so I'm not sure about that. I don't remember. I'd have to go back and check because I know that the two, the one on Lovell and the one on Walnut are still there. It was a big deal. They, it was Michigan yeah. Works used to be in there. Yeah. They, when I go to the then we'd go see them. And then I, I remember they had to move all the, they had to get special crews to, uh, cut some trees to, to do stuff with the, the electrical power. wires, the power lines, so that the house could move down the street because it was too tall. Yeah. Yes, yes, it, it was, was moved down, down Pitcher Street. street. And, and we, we have, have pictures, pictures here, here to, to show them on um, the, the day, day when, when it was moved. moved. Lots of pictures. Okay. Okay. It was when they renovated well, I, I this. When you're talking about, I know which one you're talking. About. The one that was near the train station. Yes. Yeah. And see, with that one, the guy kept having all these grand plans of what he was going to do. He worked with the historic preservation coordinator, but that was in an unprotected area, so there was little to do to prevent it from being taken down. Right. On that. So, oh yeah, okay, I remember that one. I remember that one well. Any questions? Laura, there's one in the chat. Um, yes, what was the resource you mentioned for seeing what one's house looked like at an earlier point? The Sanborn Fire Insurance Maps. Um, the Kalamazoo Public Library has two available. They've got the 1908 and the 1932, the real thing in color at the local history room on the second floor. Um, in addition, they have the Sanborns um, on microfilm. We have the Sanborns in a digital format. They're not in color. We do have the 1932 in a hardbound. And when I say hardbound, keep in mind that they're probably about four feet. I mean, they're really heavy. Um, but they, if they go to the library, they'll at least be able to see 1908 and 1932. Keep in mind that the last one we have was a revision done in 1958. So I don't know what they've done subsequently to that, but they are a lot of fun to look at and to see. Yes, the Library of Congress also has uh, copies of- available. Are those available online? Yep. Okay. So they are available both digitally and, and if you want to go up and see the second floor of the Calendar Public Library, local history. I think we have another question on the chat. 
uh, South Street question. Any truth to the rumor that there is a tunnel between the Upjohn and Gilmore houses? I think that's probably a rumor. I doubt very highly that that would be, but that's an interesting one. <laughs> okay. Something about tunnels, like, you know, you, you, I know that there were tunnels, for example, up, you get a lot of stories about Colony Farm where Asylum Lake is located. And for those of you not familiar with that, Asylum Lake, you the hospital had two farms, uh, Colony Farm, which was located there, and then also Brook Farm, which was over off Douglas. Brook Farm was much smaller than Colony Farm, but they did, a, they grew a lot of food for the people at the hospital. But they also had patients there that were not considered like flight risks or things like that. So I know that there were tunnels between that, but no, I don't think there was with that. <laughs> there was a tunnel between the old hospital and the new hospital. And that wouldn't surprise me. I remember going in it on a tour. Okay. Well, when you think of mechanicals like, and everything. I never, I mean, huge, long tunnel under the streets. I never realized that even existed. Dakota? I'm assuming that the mummy that's in the Kalamazoo Valley Children's Museum is the mummy that um, he bought? Yes. Okay. Yes, it's there. They have done a lot of study. They did um, a lot. Well, they did some other x-rays, and then they did some other things later on that really got down to a little bit as far as who it actually was. But yes, uh, at the Kalamazoo Valley Museum, that is the, that's the mummy that... Wasn't it? It was in Reading Rainbow at some point, wasn't it? Yes, because there was a book that was written called Mildred and the Mummy. Now, I'm not sure if that was on a Reading Rainbow book or not. I don't know. Maybe been another book that they had there, but I know that they've done uh, a filming of it and um, on that, but you never know. Hmm. Yes, Ben. Did uh, Donald Butterman actually make trips to Egypt for his collection? No, remember the only thing he acquired that was Egyptian related was the mummy? Yeah. He just had to go to California for that. And I don't know if it was on a whim because he went out there and he saw this and said, oh, I'm going to buy it and bring it home. <laughs> There's another myth that's, I, I don't even know where Dallas was living at the time. I don't know when Dallas died, but somebody said that when he was in the house, he wasn't very excited about having a mummy in the house. <laughs> so he also did the suit of armor, the suit of armor that's at the Kalamazoo Museum. That was also a Donald Butterman um, acquisition that he gave the museum. <laughs> and there's a story in the paper that appeared about him taking it down to Rose Street, and I can only imagine a car from the 1920s with a suit of armor trying to transport it down the street. <laughs> but that's the only thing that I know of was the mummy. That was it. It's not like A.M. Todd, who really delved into a lot of the stuff much deeper than Donald Butterman did. And plus, quite honestly, I think A.M. Todd had more of the financial means to be able to do this than Donald Butterman did. Anything else? Well, please join me in thanking my... Thank <laughs> you.